Thomas as your trusty instructor, Barbara. I have been getting some more questions about how to deal with the naming sheet, uh, the inorganic naming of binary compounds. And I thought I'll record another short video, this time uh, directly off my computer and directly off the assignment. And hopefully with a little bit more explanations, all you guys will have a better understanding how to do this. It's really not as difficult as it might at first appear. There really are only three naming rules. And I also have a condensed naming instruction document that's based on a flow chart. Um, so let's look at the flow chart one first. The three rules actually uh, just have to do with whether there is a metal present in the compound or not. Um, so you come to your decision-making point right here. It says stop and you will check is there a metal in the compound or not. Or if it's an ammonia ion, a positive charged ion, then you also would follow this path right here, this way. So yes, metal is present. Well, now what metal is present? Is it a main group metal or ammonium ion? Then you follow this path. However, is it a transition metal? And then you follow this path. If it is a metal, a main group metal, then you end up with type 1 naming, type 1. Or if you have a transition metal, you end up with type 2 naming. Or if you have no metal whatsoever in the compound, which would mean that you have a uh, covalently bonded compound, and I'll cover that <coughs> a bit later, but just to finish up the decision-making process, you don't have a metal, no, no metal, uh, then the compound consists of non-metals only, you end up with type 3 naming. So those are the three rules. And the three rules, three rules, I cover in a tad bit more detail right here. Type 1, type 2, type 3. So there's a second document that is not the flow chart type instruction uh, document but rather a little bit more extended document that also gives you the link to the other YouTube videos I've made about this type of naming. So get that one as well after you watch the video maybe and uh, read through it. Hopefully between all these different little documents in this video you should be able to do the worksheet relatively easily. There's also another document that's called Making Chemicals. Uh, another shortened little bit of a tutorial that then answers the other part to the worksheet uh, which has to deal with writing the formula for the compound. But anyhow, I will be going through these different types of rules and showing you a couple of examples uh, directly off the worksheet. So as I said, all this kind of hinges on whether you have a metal present or not. So let's look at a periodic table really quickly. And we got to switch around here. Where is my periodic table? Here's the periodic table. Um, just so for those of you who may not have looked at it very closely, what the periodic table entails, uh, you have groups from one, one, 18. 18 being the noble noble gases. And those guys we're not going to look at right now at all because they're noble. They don't want to do anything, so they're kind of uh, 
unreactive and don't participate in this type of exercise. Uh, but you have, let me see if I can switch a color. No, let's just stay with black, that's the easiest. I'll erase what I wrote here. Okay, so here are the two main group metals, one and two. And hydrogen is listed amongst these because it will form a positive charge and uh, is, in, is in group one. But it really doesn't quite fit. It's actually, if you look on uh, the color coding here, it says other nonmetals. So that is hydrogen is part of the other nonmetals. And you can ignore it. But it is in group one just because it makes a p one positive charge. The what's important about main group metals is that they will always form the same charge. Uh, for group one, it will be plus one. For group two, it will be plus two. There are cations, and the reason why they do this is because they're just one electron for group one, or one electron, and excuse my scribbles, I have this pen, this works nicely, but I, I do tend to scribble. Uh, group two has two electrons, electrons, that these are removed from the noble gases right here. So if they can, and the, the issue with any ion formation is that the element wants to look in its electronic structure like a noble gas. Since group one has one electron more than the noble gases, uh, they will want to get rid of that electron, and by getting rid of one negative charge, they'll end up being one positively charged. Whereas in group two, they will be two positively charged, because they will get rid of two electrons, one plus, two plus. So that's why. And you don't have any variation. So whenever you have these main group metals, they will always have these charges. That is compared to the transition metals, which are these guys here, the pink dudes right here. Those are the transition metals. And they, because they are in the fourth, starting in the fourth row, uh, involve another orbital, a d orbital. And for further down the road, there is some that have f orbitals. Uh, they can be actually seen down here. Those are f orbital, these guys here uh, on the bottom. They have f orbitals to play around with. And by having these extra orbitals, there's a lot of room, and they can do a lot of different things with their electrons. Uh, so transition metals will not always form the same positive charge. They can form a plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, uh, plus 5, plus 6, some of them. So you can have a whole ton of different compounds, all depending on which charge the metal has at the point. That's why there is type 2 naming, and I'll explain what that is different, or why it is different, and how it is different from type 1 naming. All right, and then you finally have nonmetals, which, right, oops, sorry. The nonmetals are these dudes in the back here. Right here, those are the nonmetals. Those are the uh, anions. Actually, take that back. These are the ones that form anions. Let me erase this. Color slide. These guys here generally can form ions. 
and they have very specific charges as well, so you don't have to uh, memorize them. It all depends, again, on the group that they are in. Uh, if the ion or the anion is in group, up. This group here, they are just one away. Hold on, I gotta switch. Group 17 is only missing one electron uh, to reach noble gas status. So these guys will pick up an extra electron and therefore become one negative charge. So a fluorine atom when it becomes an ion, it will always have a one negative charge. Same with the chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. Uh, all of them will be one negatively charged. These are, because they're two away, these guys here, group 16, because they're two away from the noble gases, will want to pick up two more electrons and become minus two charged. So oxygen, sulfur, uh, selenium, those when they form ionic compounds will carry a two negative charge. And then finally nitrogen, because it's three away from the noble gases, it will want to pick up three more electrons and become minus three charged. So these two here, if they are in a ionic compound, will carry a minus three charge generally. Carbon being sort of in the middle here um, is it's group 14. It's four away from this side as well as four away from this extreme. So carbon is relatively neutral and uh, you don't see charges on it. It wants to hold on to its electrons and rather than give them away or pick them up, will want to share and therefore form covalent compounds. This is sort of a review on the periodic table and electron structures and depending on which class you're in, you may have looked at this already or will be looking at it in some later chapters, so bear with me. but. Uh, basically, I think I covered everything that you need for the naming exercise. So let's get back to to our naming worksheet, uh, which is right here. So it is organized. I didn't mix and match the compounds. There are actually in... Uh, order of rule, so that's a big hint. Uh, row one, row one will start with type one naming, and you can verify that if you look up potassium, go to your periodic table, you'll see potassium right here. Uh, element 19 in row 4. So you know it's a main group metal and it will follow type 1 naming. So back to the worksheet. We'll go down starting with row 10. You can see that you have chromium here, CR. Uh, since most of you are probably not too familiar with the periodic table yet, go back to your periodic label, label table and confirm that chromium indeed is a transition metal. And you'll see chromium right here as element 24. It's in the pink area that I had explained earlier was part of the transition metals. And since it is a transition metal, you would follow transition metal. Oops, sorry. Transition metal, 
goes down this dark blue path, which is for type 2. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Went much too much too far. Okay. Transition metal, dark blue path, type 2 Nui. Alright. So, now to our naming. Oh, and then, sorry, one more. These guys down here, starting with this, you can see that you have carbon and oxygen, and you check carbon oxygen is any of those a metal, and as I mentioned, carbon is here, so it's not a metal, and oxygen is here, and it's not a metal either, so neither one of them are metals which means the compound that I referenced just a second ago here, uh, this guy, is a compound made up of nonmetals and therefore follows type 3 naming. Type 3. Alright. So, let's start out with an example. Each rule is used independently of the other. They're never mixed together. You will not use two rules at once. You always will use one rule at a time. And we'll start out with type 1 up at the top. I gave you an example here of Lithium. Lithium was uh, part of the main group metals, and I'm not going to switch back to the periodic table. You can verify that for yourself. The fluorine ion is an anion, and um, so you have a main group metal, anion. The name is type 1 naming. You simply list the name of the metal and the name of the anion without much uh, changing, modifying. The only thing you have to change is the anion ending. Uh, the metal is named just like the metal. The anion ending, if it's a simple anion, is changed. And I gave you examples for that. Um, in both the short naming instruction and the one with the flow chart. Uh, but there's also a list right here that is in both instruction documents where it shows you anions. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cover it all up. But here's the anion naming of simple anions. And notice here's hydrogen with a negative. This is an except not an exception, but hydrogen can go either way. It can pick up an electron or it can drop one. It can become positively charged or negatively charged, depending. So hydrogen is kind of weird. Though. But had you a hydrogen anion, it would change to ide. The anion names, when they become, when anions are created and they're simple ones, the ending is changed to ide. So like fluorine here, it becomes fluor fluoride. Um, chlorine becomes chloride. The bromine becomes bromide. Fluorine, oh, I'm sorry. Iodine becomes iodide. Oxygen becomes oxide. And finally, the last one that is in this list, there's several others still. This is just an abbreviated list. Sulfur becomes sulfide. And notice there is a D there. D. Sulfide. There are other sulfur compounds that have a T in the name. And so 
pay very, very close attention to how many oxygens there are in the anion. And this brings me to polyatomic anions, which are uh, blobs of um, more than one atom. They're glued together basically through their bonds but are charged, and the charge applies to the whole glob. But for instance here, this one is has four oxygens, and it is a sulfate with a T. So you can see sulfide, two minus. This one is simply sulfide. This one, however, SO4, 2 minus, is sulfate, with a T, this one has a D. And then here is another one, this one here, that has SO3, 2 minus, that is sulfate fight. So, depending on how much oxygen is connected to the sulfur, you can have either IDE, ITE, or ATE. And there are some others that do the same thing. These guys, for instance, here. Notice they're all similar chlorine with an oxygen attached. This one right here has only one oxygen, and it is hypo. It has the prefix of hypo and chlor, and then it at the end. And the next one with two oxygen has ClO2. And this again is a small letter L. Make sure you write this correctly. Not a capital letter. Some people um, don't realize, but if you write a capital letter, that indicates a new element, and there is no element that has an L as one letter. There's another one that has L, but it's combined with another letter. So no element has just the letter L. This is chlorine, and the first letter is capitalized, the second letter is small. So this one has two oxygens. It also has a one negative charge, but you leave off the hypo, and it just becomes chloride. Chlor and then it. And then the third one in this group, it's all the family of the halogens, ClO3 minus is chlor 8. You can see how important it is to distinguish between O, I, A, T's, and D's, and um, some other letters. Chemists are pretty m minimalistic in their spelling and their formulas. Uh, they try to express the information with as least uh, writing necessary and as least uh, the least effort. All right. So then, ClO4, also one negative charge, becomes per and then chlor, and then eight. Why am I going through this? Well, because on the worksheet you will see something that looks similar to these compounds that I just mentioned, or ions, uh, but has a different halogen in it. It's for instance, BrO4 minus. Well, as I said, this is a family and it follows the family naming pattern of the halogens. 
So rather than the ClO4 is per chlor 8. Instead of chlor, because it's brome, you put brome 8, per brome 8. Um, let me wipe this out a little bit. Let's see if I, I apologize. I'm still learning how to use this <coughs> software here. I want to change the color. Let's see if I can change color. Mm. So brome is a little thicker. Brome 04 would be per brome. And then you end up with your eight. <coughs> so rather than chlor, you now put brome. Or if you have I for iodine O2 minus, then you replace chlor with I O. D. And I just lost everything here. Uh, so rather than, hang on, let me go back to my regular pen. Rather than per <coughs> chlor 8, which is um, ClO4 minus, you have BrO4 minus um, minus it becomes per brome eight so you see how the family pattern naming works I also referenced that a little bit in the um, I'm sorry in the short naming instruction document where I show the abbreviated, the family naming pattern. I, I give you the example of the chlorine version and the fluorine version. And I'll sh I give you the items that are the same here and here, here and here in color. And then the black is the root word. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Uh, the other thing I don't believe I've touched on yet is the, um, hold on, in the worksheet, oh, sorry, in the worksheet, where's my worksheet? Here's the worksheet. Um, these anions here, these are polyatomic anions, and as I mentioned in the instructions to the worksheet itself right there at the top, it says that these, you do not make up your name. Sometimes I have students that want to combine and use a rule to make up a name for these polyatomic ions. You don't do that. You just simply look them up in the document that I, in either one of the instructions, this is the table for the polyatomic, um, hang on, for the polyatomic anions right here. So uh, you look that up there. Don't make them up. That's kind of also why I have them here, why I want you to list the name of the anion itself, meaning you have to look them up. So do that. All right, now to the naming itself. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, type 1 naming, here's potassium. You just use the metal, or here's lithium. You just use the metal name and add the anion name. And I'm giving away some more answers here. 
this one would simply become potassium chloride. Chloride. Nothing special, nothing fancy. Just combine the two names of the ions, and the positive ion and the negative ion, kind of just like I did up here too. Uh, regarding the formula, what you do is you look at the charges. If they are the same, you combine the two ions one to one, uh, just like I did here with the fluorine, or the lithium and the fluorine, uh, one lithium, one fluoride ion. Same with potassium, KCl. The charges are to the outside gone because the positive charge equals the negative charge. So you don't have to do anything, just combine the two. Here, on the other hand, in the second compound, you have francium with one positive charge and the sulfide ion with two negative charges. And the problem is now, if you were to just combine these two, uh, you'd have two negative charges and just one positive charge, and the, the compound would be charged to the outside. The goal is to make a neutral compound. Therefore, you would need two of these francium ions, and that would bring you to two positive charges, which then would neutralize the two negative charges on the sulfide ion. And the way you express this in a formula, and I have another document um, that goes, and also I have a, actually a short video made by uh, PBS that really is pretty good at showing you how to make these compounds. Uh, so this, this document here, the making of chemicals, covers in much more detail what I'm talking about. Here you have to uh, write a subscript, francium 2, which means you have two of those, and then SO3. Notice that you don't have charges here. They're gone. You combine the ions uh, with the charges in mind, and now they're equal, and you won't see them to the outside. If you were to put this in water and the compound dissolves, then, of course, you have the charges back. But if they're just dry and sitting around, you don't have any charges to the outside. Um, other things to note is, um, say you have a case where you need you have two positive charges, but only one on this one. You have to, you can't, calcium, meaning this one you would need two for this ion to get two negative charges to neutralize the two positive charges. So therefore, you have to put this in parentheses because you're going to need two of the anions. I see a lot of times where students write it like this, and you can't do that. What happens when you write it like that, you're changing the ion. You're creating something that has a carbon and two nitrogen rather than one carbon, one nitrogen. So please don't do that. The other thing I have seen, if somebody uses more than one polyatomic ion, they try to, like in math, multiply it out and then maybe write something like this. CN, C2, N2. Again, that is not how it works. That's not what the ion is. The ion is just carbon and nitrogen, not two carbons or two nitrogen. These ions, the polyatomic ions, they're like a big blob. And then the charge is all around this blob. It belongs to the whole blob, not to just one atom in the polyatomic ion, so um, make sure you just write your ion, if you use polyatomic ion, if you use more than one, make sure you write it in a parenthesis. On the, the opposite is if you just have one, 
you don't have to put in parentheses like I did just here. You can just list it like that. Chemists know that this is the sulfide anion. All right. So that covers that. Now to uh, type 2 naming. Type 2 naming, as I mentioned, is because the transition metals, these guys here, chromium, let's make sure we, we understand where chromium is. Uh, look on the periodic table, which is hiding underneath here. Look on the periodic table and verify where chromium is. But chromium is right here. It's element 24. And it is clearly in the transition metal group. And as I said before, chromium can make a whole ton of different charges. It can be plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5. And if you were, say, to combine it with a chloride anion, you wouldn't know, is it chrome 2, chrome 3, if you just called it chromium chloride. It's not identified enough to where if you just had the name, a chemist would know which chromium is it. So that is why you have to, for type 2 naming, use a Roman numeral that indicates the charge on the metal. And again, I addressed this in more detail in the naming instructions here. And actually, I'm using chromium as one of my examples right here. So, uh, and I also go through an example with iron. As an example of a compound with a transition metal would be iron two. So if you just saw uh, ion, I'm sorry, iron chloride by itself, you wouldn't know which iron it is. So the formula could be FeCl2. In this case, since chlorine always has a one negative charge, you know you have two charges from the chlorine, minus two, to have a neutral compound, <coughs> iron would have to have a 2 plus charge. By the way, this is what I wanted you to do on the test. There were a couple questions where you were supposed to work it backwards, uh, given off the name what the formula would look like. Uh, compare this to, say, another type of iron chloride, which is Fe. CL3. Again, chlorine always has a one negative charge, so because you have three, this one has three negative charges. To make it neutral, iron would have to be three plus. So see the difference right here? Three plus and three plus there and three plus here, two plus here. And they're all iron chlorides. So a chemist has to include the charge for transition metals. Hence, this guy is iron 3 chloride, while this guy here is iron 2 chloride. Pay attention to what type of metal you have. If you have a transition metal, then you have to use the Roman numeral to indicate the charge on the metal. All right, let's get back to our worksheet. Which ways? Where's my worksheet? Hold on, I'll, I'll find it. There it is. Okay, here's the worksheet. So, ah. Yes, all right, here's the case of, well, you have to look. For instance, here's another polyatomic ion that consists of OH. Uh, since, of course, the charge is minus 1 and here's a plus 1, you don't have to worry about putting it in parentheses. Uh, these two charges are equal, so you combine the ions one to one. Um, 
here is a case of one of the polyatomic ions that belong to the chlorine family, uh, the halogen family. So look based on the oxygen, which one you have, and make sure your spelling is right. Here is an example of iodine, also another one in the halogen family, follows the halogen naming pattern. And um, here we're starting with with the compounds that are covalent. They're not ionic. I don't have ions listed here because, as I said, carbon is in the middle. It doesn't want to make an ion. Similar, well, oxygen can, but it's not in this case. These are covalently bonded compounds which some, ha um, which sort of follow type one naming where you just name the first element as if it were a metal, but again, it's not a metal. And the second as if it were a non-metal where you change the ending. So in this case, and I gave you this guy here because most of you know what this is. Uh, so follow a style type one, name the metal first, carbon, and then what sets rule type three apart from type one is you have to use a prefix if you have more than one of the same atoms uh, for the first element and even if you have one for the second element. And the prefixes I posted also in the instruction document there, but they're mono for one, di for two, tri, tetra, quadra, um, um, hexa, and so forth. So look those up. And in this case, since I said you already know it, I would hope this one is carbon di for the prefix oxide. And as I said, you change the ending just like in type 1 or type 2 for the anion, if it's a simple anion. Um, say you had just CO, because it is the second element in the compound, you have to use uh, also a prefix if it's just one. So this one, CO, most of you also know this one is carbon, Mon oxide. Make sure you change the ending and be consistent with it. The second element is always treated as if it were a non-metal, but they're not. It's just as if they were. So change the ending. First element is named by its name. Second element is named and change the ending and add a prefix if you have more than one for the first element or just even one for the second element. And I believe this concludes my review of type one, type two, type three naming. Look back over the instruction documents and hopefully with by watching this video here, uh, things make a bit more change if, uh, sense. If you're watching this video, um, not the semester that I made it, which is for the summer of 16. Uh, your worksheet is probably going to look a little bit different. However, it has a very similar structure. I usually don't vary the structure. I don't mix the different rules um, from compound to compound there. It's, it's a lin linear format. So that gives you a little bit of a clue. And hopefully I won't forget that I said that and you're watching this some other time. Anyhow, uh, send me an email, though, if you need more help. As always, anybody who might not be watching this through our Hawaii uh, instruction server, it is zazi at hawaii, two e's, eyes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm 
I'm as bad now as everybody else. Edu. Zazzy, my last name at hawaii.edu, and I'll be more than happy to help. Uh, just let me know what your problem, your question are, and I'll respond. All right. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all some other time in another video, I hope.